We're not quite close enough to an election for the Obama administration to blame the Paris attacks on a YouTube video. So for now at least, everyone is acknowledging that these were bona fide terrorist attacks, not protests that got a little out of hand. But given that these were terrorist attacks, we still have to ask, what caused these attacks? Was it A, climate change, B, income inequality, C, Islamophobia, D, joblessness, E, Starbucks coffee cups, or F, Muhammad's repeated commands to wage terrorist attacks. Thanks to the power of social media to spread complete nonsense, we've all been assured that the answer can't have anything to do with Muhammad, because the Quran supposedly declares that if anyone kills a man, it's as if he has killed all mankind. I see this same verse misquoted over and over again. Here's an example. And another and another, and some more, and some more, and some more. Notice two remarkable things about this verse of the Quran. One, no one ever quotes the entire verse, and two, no one ever quotes the verse that comes after it. Why do the people who quote this verse leave most of it out? And why don't they ever quote the verse that comes after it? It's because if you read the passage without leaving something out, you'll immediately see that it actually commands the sorts of attacks that we just saw in Paris. Let's read chapter 5, verse 32, and see what our friends omitted. Because of that, we ordained for the children of Israel, we ordained for the children of Israel, Allah ordained for the children of Israel, that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. And indeed, there came to them our messengers with clear proofs, evidences, and signs. Even then, after that, many of them continued to exceed the limits, Halali and Khan add as commentary, e.g. by doing oppression unjustly and exceeding beyond the limits set by Allah by committing the major sins in the land. So the Quran says that this teaching was ordained for the children of Israel, the Jews. In fact, we know exactly where this comes from in the Jewish writings. This verse quotes the Talmud, Mishnah Sanhedrin, chapter 4, which was a popular passage among the Jews of Arabia during Muhammad's time. It's kind of ironic that the most peaceful verse in the entire Quran happens to be a quotation from the Jewish 
Talmud. In Surah 5, verse 32, Allah explains what was ordained for the Jews. So, what did Allah ordain for Muslims? The answer is found in the very next verse. Surah 5, verse 33 declares, The recompense of those who wage war against Allah and against His Messenger and do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified or their hands and their feet be cut off from opposite sides or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world, and in a great torment is theirs in the hereafter. Verse 32 is about what Jews are supposed to do in the land that Allah gave them. Verse 33 is about what Muslims are supposed to do if someone commits the vague crime of doing mischief. If you do mischief in a Muslim land, Muslims are supposed to kill you, or crucify you, or for lesser crimes, chop off body parts, or exile you. So, what counts as mischief? Lots of things. Apostasy, preaching a religion other than Islam, adultery, becoming too westernized, things like that. If you violate Sharia, you're making mischief. By opposing Sharia, you've declared war on Allah, and you have to pay. The most extreme form of mischief, of course, is launching a military attack against a Muslim community. That's definitely a death penalty. Now, according to Islamic teachings, not according to your opinion, according to Islamic teachings, has France made any mischief in Muslim countries? Yes, a lot. And according to Surah 5, verse 33, what's the penalty for the actions of the French military? Because of what the French military has done in Muslim lands? Death. So French military personnel are obviously under a death sentence. What about French civilians? Well, in Sunan Ibn Majah 2759 and Sahih al-Bukhari 2843, Muhammad said that people who equip soldiers receive the same reward as the soldiers. In other words, it's not just the soldiers who are guilty and deserve death, it's also the people who fund the military, the people who pay the bills so that soldiers can be soldiers. They're just as responsible, according to Muhammad. So, who pays for the French military to make mischief in Muslim countries? The French government, which is funded by... French taxpayers, ordinary French civilians. So if the average French civilian is just as responsible for causing problems in Muslim countries as the French soldiers who fight in Muslim countries, what's the penalty? Death. Now think about this. Surah 5, verse 33 of the Quran justifies attacks not only against French military targets, but also against everyone who supports the French military in any way. This verse justifies the terrorist attacks that just killed well over 100 people in Paris. But instead of quoting verse 33, Islam's Western apologists go to the verse before it. They cut out the part about this being a teaching of the children of Israel, a quotation from the Talmud, and they claim that their severely edited, distorted verse ripped from its context proves that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance and that anyone who does what the very next verse commands is not a true Muslim. Now, what does this sort of misrepresentation and deception ultimately accomplish? It's great for convincing westernized Muslims who don't bother reading the text that their religion condemns terrorist attacks, and it's great for convincing non-Muslims who don't bother reading the text that Islam condemns terrorist attacks. But twisting and distorting a Quran passage until it means the exact opposite of what it actually says will never change the minds of the people who read the text and are willing to do what it says. So the only thing these social media campaigns can hope to achieve is to lull us all to sleep until the next terrorist attack, a terrorist attack that's inevitable because we never confront the actual ideology that's been driving these attacks for nearly 14 centuries. What can we do to stop the deception and misdirection so that we can eventually have an open, honest discussion about Muhammad's teachings. Lots of things, most of them involving a careful study of the Muslim sources. But one easy step is for you to track down tweets and Facebook posts and comments that mislead people about Surah 5, verse 32 of the Quran until people stop misquoting it. There are only a handful of passages in the Quran that can be stretched into a condemnation of terrorism. The sooner we get past them, the sooner our Muslim friends will have a more accurate picture of Islam so that they can finally decide whether this book is worth following.
Muhammad married the divorced wife of his own adopted son. And yeah. you might say, well, kind of weird, but how would that show he's not a prophet? What do you think, Sam? Well, according to chapter 33, verse 37, and chapter 33, verse 5, 33, 37, 33, verse 5, Muhammad was told by Allah not to be ashamed of the fact that he's going to marry the divorcee of his adopted son because Muhammad is going to set precedence. His example of marrying his adopted son's divorcee would then give permission, license to other people to do the same in case they had adopted sons who also divorced women. But here's the problem. That was chapter 33, verse 37. Here's the problem. Shortly after that passage was sent down from Allah to condone what Muhammad did, <clears throat> Muhammad adopt, uh, abolished adoption altogether. Because according to the tradition, Muhammad had adopted a son named Zayd. Zayd ibn Muhammad, he was called up to that time, who divorced Zainab and Muhammad married Zainab. Well, when people started making fun of Muhammad, started mocking him, saying, look, he took his son's wife. So guess what Muhammad did in chapter 33, verse 5? Stop calling your adopted sons your sons because they are not your sons. Let me read the verse. Call them adopted sons by the names of their fathers. That is more just with Allah. But if you know not their father's names, call them your brothers in faith, right? You are your freed slaves. There is no sin on you if you make a mistake therein, except in regard to what your hearts liberally intend. And Allah is ever forgiving and most merciful. And 3340 was also sent down saying, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah, the seal of the prophet. So notice what's going on here, David. He marries Zayd's divorced wife, Zainab, who happened to be Muhammad's first cousin, to set precedence for other adoptive fathers, right, to do the same in cases of their adopted children, divorce their wives. But then after that, he abolishes adoption in order to save face because people kept mocking him. Look, you claim to be a prophet and you married your adopted son's wife? How dare you? What prophet would do that? So now how does this set precedence when he abolished adoption shortly after that? So there, you have multiple problems with this. Uh, yes. But it, this does follow a general pattern of Muhammad receiving revelations that have no purpose whatsoever other than justifying some uh, yeah. practice that would have been really seriously frowned upon by the people around him. He, he would have been regarded as doing something horribly inappropriate, marrying the divorced wife of his own adopted son after he caused the divorce, and then justifying it with a verse that makes no sense, because the reason Allah wants him to do it, why? Because uh, you have to... Uh, you have to understand it's okay to marry the divorced wives, your own adopted sons, but now I'm getting rid of adoption, so this will never apply ever again. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's absolutely yeah. silly and ridiculous, and this happens over and over again in the Muslim sources. So this is just, I mean, how obvious could it be that this does not come from God? Muhammad breaking his vows, and this is perfectly acceptable with Allah. What, what's the general rule on breaking vows in Islam, Sam? Uh, well, in Islam, <laughs> uh, if, if you're breaking an oath, there are passages that tell you you shouldn't, but if you do, then you can make expiation for it. In other words, you can make atonement, Allah forgive you. However, there are places in which Allah is actually ordering Muhammad to break his vow. There's an, actually a passage in the Quran that ta Muhammad is ordering, I'm sorry, Allah is ordering Muhammad to break his vow. So it's not simply breaking a vow and then repenting and expiating for it. Here's a situation in which the Quran itself has Allah telling Muhammad, break the vow that you made, the oath that you made towards your wife. And I think you have that reference in what the context is. Well, yeah, um, and, and I invite people to read the entire, read the entire passage. We're, we're short on time, so I'll read uh, chapter 66, verses 1 through 2, and then we'll read uh, what Tafsir Jalalain, one of the most popular Islamic commentaries of all time, says about this revelation. Chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. O Prophet, this is Allah speaking to Muhammad, why do you forbid yourself that which Allah hath made lawful for you? You seek to please your wives, and Allah is forgiving, merciful. Allah indeed has sanctioned for you the expiation of your oaths, and Allah is your protector, and He is the knowing, the wise. So notice what, what uh, Allah says here. Uh, uh, Muhammad, you... You outlawed something for yourself that I didn't tell you to do in, because you wanted to please your wives. Mm -hmm. And now I'm telling you, you can, you can cancel that oath. Well, what's this talking about? Muslims tell us to go to context. We'd love to go to the context here because this context is very, very...